Okay, let's begin. Well, this is the first lecture of Unit 3, which of course the units are out of sequence and I apologize for that. So this is the second unit that we're doing, uh, despite it being Unit 3. And that's because I sometimes shuffle uh, 2 and 3. So we're going Unit 1, 2, uh, no, 1, 3, 2, and 4. And uh, so let's, uh, first lecture is about the harmonic series. And Dr. Hicks has a nice section in the packet about the harmonic series. It's an, an extremely important part of music and sound. And, uh, well, it's been somewhat understood for thousands of years for all of human history, I assume. And then sort of codified toward the end of the 19th century by a scientist named Helmholtz. Um, and, you know, he kind of laid it out in a, a fairly straightforward way in a book called On the Sensation of Tone. And this was a book that was widely read and owned by composers of the late 19th and, and most of the 20th century. So it's, it's understandable that the harmonic series and its structure came to influence composers of this period quite profoundly, certainly WC and you know, everybody that we talk about this, this semester. Well, let's talk about the harmonic series. First thing I want to do is I want to break sound down. Now, um, the sounds that we usually think of as being musical, maybe correctly or incorrectly, uh, we tend to identify as having a, a pitch, an identifiable pitch, but there are some musical sounds that uh, don't have an identifiable pitch, and sometimes one might, uh, let's see if this works. We could take, uh, for instance, orchestral instruments and um, put them on a continuum of least pitched to most straightforwardly pitched. I don't know. You know, we could have maybe like a cymbal over here and maybe a flute or even farther uh, pitch tuning fork fork and then over here we might you know get a clarinet violin oboe etc over here we might have a triangle um, tom tom timpani we're starting to get more and more straightforwardly pitched instruments of, as we move in this direction um, well, already we're seeing that <clears throat> there, there's a continuum of, of pitched and non-pitched sounds and, and in between. We might have, you know, bells over here. You think of the, the uh, bell tower at, at BYU, which of course is mostly pitched, but it has some, some sounds in it that don't sound like they fit in the same way as, as let's say, on a glockenspiel or a vibraphone. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> well, um, every sound is a composite of pitches. Every sound. And um, <clears throat> the, the sounds furthest to the left here, we could get all the way to what we call white noise, which is theoretically a sound that contains all of the audible pitches in it. I'm not sure how that works, but you know, something like that. Uh, some of you might have white noise generators that help you to sleep. And, um, <clears throat> well, this idea that um, every sound is a composite of pitches is a really important one. And it, uh, the relative uh, strength of different pitched sounds in a single what we perceive as a single sound is, is probably the most important part of timbre or tone quality, tone color, in a sound or in an instrument or a voice. Certainly also how we form vowels is the relative strength or weakness of these miniature sort of pitched sounds. Now, there are three terms we might encounter. Again, this is my formulation. Some might disagree. 
since I, I have friends that, that look at these sometimes, they may disagree, but I'm going to stick with my formulation. Let me fix this tripod a little bit so it doesn't tip over. Um, okay, so let's look at this. So these uh, pitched sounds that, that come together to form, uh, you know, a composite sound, we would call partials. Okay, so that's the most all-encompassing term. Okay, and then we get a little more specific than that. We have um, harmonic partials, which we call harmonics. Those are harmonic partials, and then inharmonic partials. Okay. And then we could get a little more specific and we could talk about overtones. Now this is a very fine distinction between harmonics and overtones. Now I should say that some people use the word partial to mean exactly the same thing as harmonics. So it's, uh, these are words that are, I don't know if they're used sloppily or it's just different idioms, but in our formulation for Music 296, a partial is any pitch that goes into a composite sound, whether, you know, anywhere on the spectrum, whether it's inharmonic or harmonic. But we're going to focus on the harmonic partials, and those are called harmonics, and they form in uh, every case in nature, at least in our universe, they form what we call the harmonic series. And the harmonic series has had a very profound influence on music. It would have to, because it's built into sound. Um, so, you may recall that in your reading you read some, some of the uh, words of Schoenberg who described how we go up the harmonic series. The harmonic series starts with an octave, then a fifth, then a fourth, then a major third. It, the intervals get smaller and smaller. And his thinking was that that was uh, the history of music and uh, composer's acceptance of different intervals as consonances evolved basically up the harmonic series so that the unison was of course always accepted then the octave was accepted as a consonance as a simultaneity so this became acceptable then the fifth became acceptable then the fourth and then the third major third then the minor third and then we mentioned that when we get to the music of Debussy, the major second or the minor seventh become consonances. And then his point, and, and the tritone for that matter, if we get these Debussy chords, chords like that where we have, you know, it's like an ending sonority, a sonority that doesn't have to resolve. Well, you remember Emancipation of the Dissonance, meaning the minor seventh, is no longer a dissonance, the tritone is no longer a dissonance, and then Schoenberg is basically saying, well, there's only one left, which is the minor second or the major seventh, and so he said, let's just get rid of dissonance uh, altogether and emancipate it, and everything's consonant, every interval has its own unique role to play, I guess you could say, or sound. There are lots of other applications I'll talk about in a minute, but first let's talk about the harmonic series. So, um, <clears throat> the harmonic series, again, every pitched sound, pretty much every pitched sound, there, there are only a few exceptions. With electronic instruments, we have the, the sine tone, which is a, uh, a sound that only has, that doesn't have any uh, overtones. And there are some instruments that don't have very much, but pretty much most instruments have a series that's as follows. First, I'll show it to you on the staff. Let's pull this up. So, we have... Uh, okay, so let's say we will draw a grand staff. I'm sorry, this is kind of hard to do, but we'll make it work. Uh, let's say we start with this C here, C2. Okay, 
That's the first harmonic, the fundamental. And that is the note that we, that we hear, that we identify a pitch by. So here's the, that note on the piano. Now, in addition to that first harmonic, we're going to hear a bunch of other pitches that make that sound what it is. Now, I'm going to demonstrate by hacking into the piano a little bit. So let's set up this camera so you can kind of see what I'm doing to my piano. And this is my piano, so I can do whatever I want to it. I, BYU doesn't always look kindly on this kind of thing, but, you know, you never know. Things might change. Okay, so... See, I'm playing this C here. Let's see if we can get it so you can see everything that's going on. I don't know if that's possible. Let's zoom out. out. Okay, so I'm playing the note. And then, let's get this to happen. I think we can make this work. Okay, then I'm going to, here's my C. Now, as you may know, a string uh, operates in a kind of an interesting way. You have a string and it vibrates in loops. And, uh, you know, if you do jump rope, you, you know how this works. Or if you stretch a string and you can kind of wave it. But if you look at a string, you can watch this happen. Um, the frame rate on this is not fast enough to perceive this, but it's going to vibrate one loop and then it's going to split into two loops and three and four and five, etc. Strings actually do that. If you look at film and slow it down, you can kind of see this. And um, those of you who play string instruments know that we can raise a sound if you play guitar or violin or cello or viola or string bass or whatever you touch the string at certain places like in the very center of the string and what happens is you prevent one of those loops from from vibrating so that the next uh faster higher loop is is the one that we hear as the lowest pitch and thus the fundamental the tone that we uh, define that sound as. So let me demonstrate this here. I'm going to do that with this C. I'm going to try to touch it right in the middle. Uh, it's hard to... There we go. So listen carefully. I'm going to play the note, this C2, and then I'm going to touch it right in the middle and I'm going to peel off the first harmonic, or the fundamental. Now let me play it again. See if you can hear, see if you can hear that note inside of the, the whole thing. I'll touch it again. Okay, so you can see we have at least two pitches in this C, supposed C2. Uh, we've got this C2, which is the fundamental first harmonic. And then we've got the second harmonic, which is C3. Right? And I can compare them, you know. I just got this piano tuned, so it's doing pretty well. This is this is my the Avant Garage, my garage, and it's very hot. It's in the 90s right now. I don't have it cooled, so I don't know how long it's going to keep its tuning. Okay, well let's let's keep going. I'm going to keep touching the string in different spots and removing these harmonics, these parts of the harmonic series, and you can see how what sounds like a single pitch is really a whole bunch of pitches, really running the entire gamut of the range of human hearing. Okay, the next one up, let's, let's see if, it'll take me a moment to find it. This is maybe, this is maybe not the 
best string to use, but let me... Okay, here we go. Now listen carefully, I'm going to play the whole note and then I'm going to peel off the first two harmonics. Okay, now I'm going to play the whole note again. Listen for that harmonic. Do you hear it? Now I'm going to peel off the first two harmonics. Okay, so can you guess which note that is? That is correct. It's a G. It's a G3 right here. And that's the third harmonic. Okay, so, so far we have... Those are the first three harmonics. Octave, perfect fifth. Okay, let's keep going up. See what the next one is. one is this C right here. That's the fourth harmonic. Let's keep going up. I'm going to go back to the original C because it's not quite. sort of basically our first harmonic that's not really in conformity with equal temperament. It's the major third and uh, it's what we call a just major third between the C and the E. And in order to accommodate equal temperament to be able to play music in all 12 keys or all 24 keys I guess uh, the piano is tuned to the system called equal temperament. We're going to talk about that in the fourth unit, but that means that certain intervals, like major thirds especially, are out of tune with the way they should be with the what we call just intervals. But that's felt to be a, uh, a worthwhile trade-off, and lots of people argue about that. Anyway, so that's our fifth harmonic. We'll go up a little bit more. Um, <laughs> having trouble 
climbing it, sorry, because there's this big bar and like... No, it's hard. Okay, I'm having trouble finding it. You'll have to take my word for it. The next one is, and you might start to see a pattern here, is G for that six. But let's go to the seventh harmonic, which is the next really exciting harmonic. Okay, that's the seventh harmonic. Now I'll try to peel it away like I did before. Listen carefully, this is really interesting. Those are quite different. And in fact, sorry, that's called the septimal seventh, which sounds uh, a little bit redundant, um, but it's the seventh harmonic, and coincidentally, it's also a minor seventh. Now sometimes this is filled in like this, indicating that it's a seventh that's flatter than a you know B flat. It is. So it's it's like a miniature minor seventh. And um, so anyway, you can see that so far we have something very recognizable. I'll play it on the piano. and a little bit lower E. That's a dominant seventh chord and of course it's not an accident that the dominant seventh chord is such an important sonority in lots of kinds of music. Um, let's keep going up. Maybe I won't write these down but you can get well I will but I gotta stop using the pedal that's my problem here. There's the ninth harmonic. That one's a little bigger than the... That's a really cool one. That's the eleventh harmonic. Be an F sharp, but not... It's a very low F sharp. It's almost a F quarter sharp. Anyway. Okay, that's the um, 13th harmonic. But you can see it's a little flat of an A. And then we've got the 14th, which will sort of be there. 15th. I don't know if I can get that 15th to come up. Anyway, I'm just going to have to write them down and then play them, play the fake equal tempered versions of them on the piano, but you've got your, you know, at least we heard it up to here, and I apologize that I was abusing the pedal. I usually do this on an upright piano where I have to get down on the floor and I can't use the pedal. But anyway, here's our eighth, ninth would be a D, tenth would be an E. I mean, isn't that interesting? That's the seventh, if you're familiar, which you should be from Music 295, the upper extensions of seventh chords. That's the seventh. That's the ninth of a ninth chord. And then a tenth, of course. This is coincidental. 
That's the 11th harmonic, but it's also called the 11th of a chord, of a C dominant 7th chord. 12, 13, 14. And these are kind of approximate. Again, they don't... 15, and then 16th harmonic is, of course, that C way up there. So... And let me play them for you. So first, harm, first harmonic, or the fundamental. Second is an octave up. Third is a perf octave plus a perfect fifth. Fourth is two octaves up. Fifth is a two octaves plus a major third. Of course, it's a little bit flat of the way it sounds on the piano. Sixth harmonic, you'll notice, is a G, which we've already seen. This helps us to understand that, uh, and again, we, we don't necessarily have time to go into all this into just intonation, but octaves always double. Um, well, okay, I should introduce another concept. What's really cool about numbering these harmonics is that these numbers also represent uh, ratios between the frequencies of these pitches. Okay, so if this were, let's say, 100 cycles per second, which it's not, uh, this would be 200, this would be 300, this would be 400, etc. So that's really cool. In, in intonation theory, we use, uh, we use ratios a lot. Um, let me put this up a little bit. Okay, so um, now what's cool here is you'll notice that uh, when we double a number, it gives us an octave. So the octave, in terms of frequency, is a doubling of the frequency. That's what an octave does. But we also notice that the perfect fifth is a 2 to 3 ratio. The perfect fourth is a 3 to 4 ratio. The major third is a 4 to 5 ratio, etc., all the way up the line. So those are kind of cool to know about. But you'll notice that all the C's are going to be multiples of 2, I guess. Or, no, 2 factorial, is I think it is. So 1, 2, 4, 8, uh, 16. Those are all C's. And then we could do the same thing with all the other multiples of ratios. We could figure that out mathematically, which we're not going to do right now, but... Um, let's see. I mean, what we could do is, uh, well, we could, we could say, take another ratio, for instance, the perfect fifth, which is a two to three, and, um, we could take our four to five ratio, we multiply five by three, we should get a perfect fifth plus an octave above that, which we do for 15. 3 times 5 is 15. Anyway, don't worry too much about that. That's more enrichment. We may cover that more when we talk about just intonation. Okay, so anyway, I pointed out to you that, and this is just a quirk, or maybe it's a sign of, you know, the presence of the divine, uh, but, you know, these are the numbers for the harmonic series, but starting with, um, with seven, they also indicate chord tones. Seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, at least up to there, those are very familiar. So you've got your, this is your, once again, one, two, three, four, five, six, here's your seven, seven, that's your ninth harmonic. It's also the ninth of a ninth chord. And then this is your... That's your eleventh, eleventh harmonic, but it's also the uh, eleventh of a, you know, an eleventh chord or a thirteenth chord. And then this is the thirteenth. So, again, in jazz and popular music, etc. That's the 13th of a 13th chord, right? So that's kind of cool.
So this is the harmonic series. Of course, you have it in the Hicks packet. And I've, you've been asked to. These, it's an interval pattern that we're going to find above any pitch. And there's so many implications of this. We'll talk about a few of those in a moment. But um, let's see, what else do we want to talk about? Um, okay, let's talk about uh, the implication. Oh, I wanted to say, okay, the term overtones. So these are all numbered harmonics in the harmonic series. Well, overtones are the set of harmonics that doesn't include the fundamental. So if we were talking about overtones, the overtone series starts with this second harmonic. And in fact, they would number them that would be the first overtone, the second overtone, the third overtone, fourth overtone, etc. Do not use this system. It's bad. And it, it takes away all this beautiful information we get from numbering this this way, which is this, specifically the ratios of these pitches to one another. And the acknowledgement that the fundamental is simply the first overtone. Uh, we get some instruments where the fundamental is weak enough that um, it starts to not feel like the fundamental. You know, you think of uh, some people who play the flute either badly or deliberately kind of, uh, kind of, well, you hear saxophonists doubling on flute and the, the fundamental is kind of weak and the, it sounds like it's added on. Or the, certainly I mentioned bells where the fundamental might not be the, the tone that we identify that pitch by. So that would be a case where we might want to, uh, you know, think differently. Now, of course, if you play a brass instrument, especially you're very familiar with this, this is how brass players play their pitches, is that they use their embouchure to divide, and their lips, to divide the tube they're buzzing into um, and, and sort of uh, bypass uh, these harmonics, which is why you hear, you know, and then maybe the, what's called the pedal tone, which is actually the fundamental, which is actually difficult to play on a brass instrument. Same thing to a lesser extent on woodwind instruments. So anyway, overtones, it's kind of like the difference between the whole numbers and the natural numbers. The, the uh, overtones is, is the same series as the harmonic series, but it does not include the fundamental and it starts the numbering with the second harmonic. Don't use the overtone series. We're just going to stick with the harmonic series. And then any sound uh, in a, in a you know, pitch sound that doesn't conform to this harmonic series is an inharmonic partial. And we get that a lot with, uh, again, bells. You can, again, if you listen to the bell tower at BYU, I don't know what key it's in, but... Um, you know, it plays Come Coming Saints, but then you can faintly hear this. There's a, an inharmonic partial that's a major sixth below what we hear as the fundamental. Now, there may be something more complex going on than that, but at any rate, that's kind of how that works. Now, let's talk a little bit about the implications of all this, and I think we can, you might not need to use the piano quite so much. Um, so how does this apply to uh, the music that we'll be studying in this unit on uh, post-impressionism and, and neoclassicism? Well, I will explain it. So we have several units. And, and Dr. Hicks explains this in his really nice article. The first idea that you already learned about in 295 is about planing. So this idea of, you know, well, you know, you think of the Ravel Bolero. I don't know what key it's in. I don't even remember if I'm doing the melody right, but he starts to double it. And then we have, so I've, so I've doubled it at the fifth. 
where does that idea come from? And I think eventually... Etc. I don't remember it that well. Well, this is the idea that, you know, if you're playing... Well, as we learned, that already has... This note already has... All these notes, all those pitches are in there. We don't hear them as separate pitches, but they're in there. So why not reinforce not just the octave, but the octave plus a fifth, the, the, in other words, the third harmonic, or the octave, two octaves plus a major third, the fifth harmonic, etc. The seventh harmonic, you know, etc. And of course, those of you who play organ, pipe organ, or even Hammond organ are very familiar with creating timbres or sounds by adding essentially fake harmonics onto a sound using registrations that don't just go up multiples of octaves, but go up multiples of octaves and fifths or major thirds specifically. That's pretty much as far as it goes uh, in, in organs traditionally. Um, okay, so planing. Well, then we start to get these phenomena of uh, polyharmony, you know. We'll talk about more of this, but, you know, I'm doing planning. Let's say I have that, and then that's kind of a planing, chromatic planing using this second inversion major triad. I could have another part of the texture. Another. Those are root position major triads. And we get a lot of this kind of thing in the music of, um, well, a lot of the American symphonists, uh, William Schumann, uh, Copland, um, trying to think who else, Walter Piston. Um, and a little bit in, in lots of other slightly more familiar composers, Stravinsky. Um, but this, this is, comes directly out of the idea that, well, if we have two-part counterpoint, you know... But since those, harmon those pitches are already there, present in these individual pitches that make up this two-part uh, counterpoint, why not fill those in? That might be kind of fun. That might be sort of logical in a way. So polyharmony, same concept with polytonality, which we will learn about music that's in more than one key at the same time. I mean, somewhat, actually. I don't know if that really applies. I'm trying to think now. Um, and then this idea that Schoenberg actually talked about, about building very early on, about building harmonies out of uh, intervals other than the third. You know, of course, we're used to the major and minor triad. You know, we learn, you know, tertial harmony, harmony built out of thirds. Well, uh, you know, because the third's so prominent in the harmonic series. Right? First non octave, non fifth interval. Well, why not? Um, the fourth happens sooner, the fifth happens even sooner, so why not have chords built chords out of fifths or fourths? Why not? You know, you can do that. So, quartal and quintal harmony, and then as we get up the harmonic series. seconds of various sizes and that's kind of cool because there are all these different uh, major seconds and they gradually get smaller and smaller so there's several just major and minor seconds that that <laughs> exist in nature uh, but at any rate um, you know why not build harmonies out of seconds We'll learn 
about secundal harmony and tone clusters, which I'm sure you've all heard. That, I think, was an outgrowth of the harmonic series. And, uh, and even the idea of pandiatonicism, which is a, almost like a kind of secundal harmony. And uh, what's the other topic we're learning? I think I, that about covers it. So, anyway, this is the harmonic series. Very important thing to know. You'll need to be able to uh, build a harmonic series above kind of any note that given to you up to the 16th harmonic. So again, you've got that guide. Uh, Dr. Hicks, you know, I gave you some homework where you have to build, uh, you only have to name certain harmonics above a given uh, fundamental. So again, if I were to take, uh, let's say, uh, instead of C, let's say I were to take A. Okay, well A is going to be the first harmonic. A1, A2 will be the second harmonic. A3, the third harmonic. A4, the fourth harmonic. Sorry, I'm numbering these. harmonic, A, 8th harmonic, ninth is B, 10th is C sharp, 11th is D sharp, 12th is E, we're up to E5 now, uh, 13th is F sharp, sort of, uh, 14th is, again, 14th you can remember, it's double the 7th harmonic, 7 times 2 is 4. I have 14, uh, and then 15th is the G sharp, and then we're back to the 16th harmonic, which is two times, you know, uh, A up all these octaves. You know what's cool is even in an equal tempered piano, it, it really kind of vibrates and sings to play these harmonics. Goodbye.